Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about the science behind coral foods. Do they actually work or are we just buying into the hype? Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the science of feeding corals, uh, whether uh, uh, the products that we see on the market today, whether they're actually scientifically proven to improve the growth rates of corals or whether it, we're just essentially uh, buying products based on uh, marketing and hype. Uh, so I did uh, a, a literature search, looked in, uh, into scientific journals uh, that tested the effects of uh, feeding corals on their health. And I actually managed to, find, to only find two papers, uh, which I'm going to uh, show you uh, the results and, and we're going to have a little, bit of, a little bit of discussion about them. Uh, so the first paper that I'm going to talk about was published in 2011 in the Journal of Marine Biological Association of the United Kingdom. And uh, it was uh, uh, the, the first author is Zach Forsman uh, from the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. Uh, and then I'm going to, after presenting that results, I'm going to talk about uh, a very recent paper uh, uh, that came out, I think, uh, late last year uh, uh, in uh, the journal PLOS One. And the first author is Jessica Conlon. Uh, from uh, Deakin University in uh, in Victoria, Australia. Hopefully I didn't butcher that one. Uh, so both of them are, I thought, really good papers that deal with the subject uh, about coral feeding. And both of them have uh, pretty surprising results. So let's get started. Uh, so the first paper, uh, it, it, essentially both of these papers are motivated by the fact that uh, uh, we know very little about uh, what to feed corals uh, uh, to make uh, uh, to make them grow in, in aquaculture uh, and how uh, potentially that this is a really important part of uh, coral biology that we have to understand if we were to uh, grow uh, aquaculture many many species and and possibly use aquaculture as a way uh, to uh, recover uh, uh, the food, uh, recover natural reefs uh, so in the first paper uh, they, the authors had kind of two experiments. Uh, the first experiment uh, was kind of an intensive uh, testing of these uh, four, uh, uh, four foods, uh, oyster eggs, uh, roti feast, reef chili, and reef roids. And reef roids is something that I, I've, I've used in the past and I'm currently using. And so they tested these four products on three coral species. The corals were fed four times per week based on the uh, manufacturer's recommended dosage, uh, dosage and the experiment ran for 12 weeks. And then in the second experiment, they tested uh, four, uh, actually five cheaper uh, uh, foods, uh, microvert, marine snow, plankton diet, phytoplan, and sulfur cor coral foods. Uh, some of these names I'm not familiar with. Um, uh, they tested these chemicals on two corals, and we're going to talk about what the corals now. And, and they talked about uh, they tested the chemicals at like essentially uh, like no uh, no food was added. They added the recommended amount. They added three times the recommended amount and ten times the recommended amount. And they ran this experiment for forty five days. So this experiment was uh, talking about was it trying to find out whether feeding more often is going to have a benefit on the corals. All right. So the first experiment. Uh, you're looking at the three species. Uh, so on here, you're talking about that. Uh, you're looking at the change in weight in grams over, uh, uh, I think, the twelve-week experiment. And the three species that they tested the foods on were uh, MCs, Montipora, uh, Aporites, and uh, Pocillopora. So that's a cauliflower coral. And uh, the conditions were filtered seawater. So that's a control. The oyster eggs, roti feast, reef chili, and reef roids. So here is showing the growth with just filtered water. So this is kind of the baseline. This is the growth that you would yeah you would expect when when for uh, when the corals are not getting fed, and the oyster feast the tanks that were the, and the corals that were fed oyster feast. You see that their growth actually did not significantly different at all with the filtered seawater. So right away, like oyster eggs is not doing anything for these three species. Uh, Rhodi feast has a, had a positive effect on the Montipora, so the Montipora grows significantly larger with Rhodi feast, but the Porites and the, and, and uh, Pocillopora did not show any differences uh, from the filtered seawater. Uh, reef chili and reef roids actually did the best here. So the Montipora that were uh, fed reef chili, uh, they grew a lot uh, bigger, a lot faster. 
and filtered seawater, and so did the Pustulopora, uh, and same with the Rephroids. So the Rephroids, uh, the Montipora and the Pustulopora that were given Rephroids did better uh, than the filtered seawater. So just looking at that, it suggests that uh, at least uh, two of these products that were tested, Reef Chili and Rephroids, had a positive effect on coral growth. For now, I'll, we're gonna we're gonna revisit this because this looks really really good, uh, and and when you see this results, it's like yeah yeah uh, like I should keep on doing with refroids. It's it's having a beneficial effect, uh, but we're gonna come back to this and and we're gonna discuss whether really this is a beneficial effect or not, and and the key to this is how well do we believe that filtered seawater is a good control. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to move on and just a quick summary. So from the first study, uh, oyster eggs received uh, a big no. Rody feast was kind of like neither here or there. And, and reef chili and reef roid seem to do the best in terms of enhancing growth uh, for Montipora and uh, Pusillopora. Uh, one thing that the authors noted here is that uh, although the coral fragments uh, grew faster in, uh, with reef roids and reef chili treatment, it is important to note that there was an abundance of algae growth in the treatment tanks relative to other treatments. There is a likely a fine line between feeding and overfeeding regardless of the dose coral fragments that were fed nutrient rich foods will require more herbivores or frequent cleaning. So that's just a, a disclaimer that this enhanced growth that you saw with uh, over with the reef roids and reef chili uh, has a cost in, in terms of promoting uh, algae growth uh, uh, in, in your aquarium. So it's something that you need to manage if you're going to feed your tank. All right, uh, in their second experiment, just a reminder, they tested microvert, marine snow, plankton diet, phytoplankton, sulfur coral food uh, at one time, the recommended dosage three times, 10 times. And they ran the experiment for 45 days. And here, the, essentially, the results was a big zil. So uh, none of these foods... Uh, uh, so on, on the y-axis again, we have net growth over the 45 uh, uh, week period. And this is how much dose they got. Uh, zero means they got nothing. Uh, one means they got the recommended dose. Two, they got twice. Three, they got three times the recommended dose and 10 times. So looking at one versus zero here, there actually is no difference in the growth rate of parietes and Montipora uh, given the recommended dose versus no dose of uh, any of these uh, five foods. So none of these foods, uh, here we're looking at the averages, but the authors present analysis uh, for each food separately, and none of these foods actually have uh, a posit had a positive effect on increasing the growth rates of, uh, of these two corals. And the more you fed, so if you fed the corals three times or 10 times the recommended amount, you actually got lower growth than if you haven't fed them at all. So that means that there, there is uh, uh, that feeding them has no effect on growth and overfeeding them has a negative effect on growth. So just a review, none of these uh, in the second experiment, none of these uh, 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 foods, uh, coral foods had a, a positive effect on coral growth uh, and overfeeding them led to a negative effect. So uh, that's a, a bad for microvert, marine snow, plankton diet, phytoplankton, and sulfur coral food. Okay, so again, just a quick summary. They, uh, the authors here tested nine foods and eight, uh, uh, seven out of the nine had no or negative effects on coral growth uh, and only two appeared to have a benefit. And I say appear to have a benefit because remember all of this is all of this positive enhancement of growth of Montipora and Pustulopora, fed reef chili and reef roids. Uh, is is based on comparing these treatments with filtered seawater and the question that uh, the second paper that we're going to discuss posed is is filtered seawater a good control here uh, are we seeing a positive effect in these experiments because uh, the corals the, the food is actually enhancing the health of these corals or whether filtered feed seawater is just really a crummy media for growing corals all right, so I'm going to shift gears into the second study. This is called comparing the capacity of five different dietary treatments to optimize growth and nutritional composition of two corals uh, by Jessica uh, Conlan. Uh, this paper is open access, so you could actually uh, download it uh, from the PLOS ONE uh, website. 
And while I was doing my research, I found that Jessica, uh, Dr. Conlon, actually, she just uh, defended her PhD. Uh, her whole thesis is in coral, uh, coral nutrition. And you could actually download her dissertation, which includes this paper, as well as four other papers that are all about uh, coral uh, gr uh, coral. Uh, uh, the nutritional uh, requirements and, and, and dietary requirements. So it's, it was a, a fun read. And again, you know, they start out their paper by, by essentially talking about the lack of any rigorous scientific research uh, to optimize uh, current practice in, uh, in uh, aquarium trade. So, uh, you know, we all believe that uh, the companies that we buy our uh, foods from have, have done some kind of research. Uh, but a lot of it, uh, it, a lot of essentially a lot of the trade and 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 the foods that we buy for corals are uh, it's are not regulated, uh, and there isn't any scientific or there very there's very little published scientific research uh, on whether the the foods that we buy are actually having a benefit. One thing that this paper kind of discusses a little bit is whether we kind of need to feed corals at all. So we know that corals uh, have uh, zooxanthellae, which provide them with uh, up to like nine percent of their uh, uh, daily energy requirements uh, but that what they note is that the uh, the, f uh, the food that is essentially provided by the zooxanthellae tends to be deficient in nitrogen and phosphorus uh, which are critical nutrients uh, uh, as the authors here say critical nutrients in for coral health uh, so uh, nitrogen is needed for uh, macromolecule, uh, macromolecules like amino acids uh, proteins um, and uh, and P is really important uh, for uh, growth and metabolism, and obviously uh, phosphorus is needed for making DNA. Uh, and so uh, they kind of stress the importance of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And uh, if you haven't already seen my first uh, first video in the series about uh, forget what you know about nutrients, uh, I, I'm gonna put up a link up here, and I, I highly recommend you have a look. Uh, it, it's a critical look about the importance of nutrients in our aquarium and how. Uh, uh, ultra neuronutrient systems could actually be detrimental to coral growth. Uh, but uh, we're just going to go on and talk about their experiments. So here uh, they used five uh, diet treatments uh, and they tested those out on Acropora, Millipora, as well as uh, uh, Postulopora again, so cauliflower corals. Uh, so the treatments were a control, which is uh, just like in the first experiment, just filtered seawater. Uh, they used life art, uh, live artemia, so that was a live food. Uh, they tried out an artificial diet. It's called an AIMS diet. The AIMS stands for the Australian Institute for uh, Marine Science. Uh, they don't tell us exactly what the AIMS is, but it seems like uh, some kind of custom diet that the Institute has developed. Then, interestingly, they used unfiltered seawater, so water just out of the bay, out of, out of the ocean, uh, uh, without being filtered or, or cleaned in any way. And then they used rephroids. Uh, so here's our three treatments, and, uh, and they tested it on Acropora and uh, Postlepora. The corals were fed twice a day at uh, 0.05 gram per tank per day, uh, and the experiment lasted 90 days, so a good three months. And uh, the results are as follows. So this is uh, uh, Acropora millipora, and here they show us the amount of weight gain over the experiment, uh, how much protein is uh, in the coral tissues, the density of zooxanthellae, as well as the fat, uh, the fat, the lipid content of the corals. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to walk you through the first graph, which is weight gain. Uh, the first one is the life artemia. Uh, then this is the uh, the uh, the, uh, the diet, the, uh, the Australian, the AIMS diet. Uh, this is the controlled seawater. Uh, here is the raw water, the unfiltered seawater, and here is the rephroids. So for growth, uh, the control is here. Uh, anything that's got an A here means it's, it wasn't significantly different from the control. So Artemia was not significantly different from the control. Uh, the AIMS diet was not significantly different. The rephroids was not significantly different from the control. So rephroids here had no apparently no effect on growth for uh, uh, Acropora millipora. The only thing that worked that in enhanced growth was the raw unfiltered seawater. So l let me just rephrase that. Raw unfiltered seawater is several times better than refroids in terms of uh, making Acropora millipora grow. Uh, 
pretty shocking. Uh, on here, there was kind of no difference in the amount of protein in the tissue, but again, the, uh, the corals that were fed raw unfiltered seawater had the highest uh, uh, density of zooxanthellae, uh, and, the, and they had more lipid in their tissues. So for the Acropora millibora, the best diet was raw unfiltered seawater. Uh, Refroids and the Ames artificial diet were, were not any different from the control. Uh, now for the Pocillopora, again, we have the same pa uh, panels and the number is the same. So here we have Artemia, uh, the Ames diet, uh, the control, uh, raw seawater, and, and refroids. And here we got a different result. So the control is here and anything that's got to be is not significantly different from the control. Uh, so uh, in this treatment for the Pocillopora, the, the, the diet that had the best benefit uh, was uh, uh, in terms of growth was the Artemia. So life Artemia uh, had the highest uh, uh, growth rates. Uh, so just to kind of review, here is the summary of the four, uh, the five treatments, and and right away you see that uh, the what worked for Acropora really well, which is unfiltered seawater. Uh, didn't work as well for the Pocillopora. So for the Pocillopora, Artemia was the best, uh, and for the Acropora, unfiltered seawater was the best. Both of these uh, things essentially contain live organisms. Uh, so the artificial diets in both of these trials uh, did not do as well as either uh, live uh, Artemia or, or, or live seawater, so to speak, seawater from the sea with all of the microorganisms and nutrients intact. So just going back on the seawater, what, what the, uh, Dr. Conlon did in the paper, she actually looked at the composition of filtered seawater versus raw seawater. And obviously many things were different, uh, but I highlighted a few things here. So uh, the raw seawater contained more nutrients. It was dirty than the filtered seawater. So it had more uh, nitrates, it had more phosphates, it had more particulate phosphates. It also had a whole bunch of more uh, like live organisms, like uh, well, uh, bacterial, uh, presumably live organisms like bacterial uh, uh, bacteria and and viruses. Uh, so uh, whether whether the uh, Acropora is actually feeding on some of these small particles, it, it's difficult to know. But uh, there there is an emerging literature from uh, outside of corals of uh, you know there there is a lot of things that are consuming uh, bacteria and viruses that we didn't uh, pre uh, that we uh, we didn't previously realize that this was happening to that extent in in animals. Uh, all right, so. Uh, they end with something that is uh, really interesting here. So it, essentially what, where I'm going with this is that uh, they're attributing the fact that the natural diets contain more nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, which the zooxanthellae are kind of, uh, the food that the zooxanthellae provide the corals are, are deficient in. So what the authors are, are essentially suggesting is that this excess nutrients uh, nitrogen and, and uh, organic nitrogen and, and phosphates are what's causing the higher growth rates of uh, Acropora and Pulsopora, uh, 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 the cauliflower corals in their experiment. So just uh, some of my conclusions about this is, is that life food is key. And it, if we think of our, our, in our aquarium, uh, anything that you could do to essentially uh, enhance the diversity of microorganisms in your tank is probably going to be beneficial for the growth rates of your corals. Uh, so in, in my tank, I have things like uh, snail spawning, uh, and uh, you know I, I have lots of sponges and and, and lots of microorganisms, uh, lots of copepods, and and I think that to some level these organisms are directly uh, are directly either being preyed upon by by corals or or uh, uh, or the, or they're preyed upon by other things that the corals are are eating. So I, I think biodiversity matters here. Uh, and as the authors point out, that nutrients are important. So uh, we, we again we talked a little bit about this. We talked a lot about this in my first video on uh, forget what you know about nitrous and phosphates. Uh, uh, there, there is the, the the most recent work suggests that uh, nitrates and phosphates are important. Uh, nutrients are important, and if if you're uh, if you're uh, depleting the tank of your nutrients, uh, you're reducing the amount of biodiversity that your tank can sustain, and that essentially reduces, I think, the amount of live foods that your corals could be consuming. Uh, 
and uh, one point, one important point that came out from uh, the last study was that uh, the, you know, the raw seawater was by far the best things for acropora and millipora uh, relative to the filtered seawater. So that got me thinking, are we essentially over filtering the tank? Are, are we running the tank too clean? Are we removing a lot of the organisms? Are, are our filters removing uh, a lot of the organisms that the corals could be consuming? Uh, so maybe polishing the water is not something that we should strive for. Uh, just anecdotally, uh, I, and if you've been following my tank updates uh, for the past month, uh, I've removed all fertile filter socks. I actually, I, I did that not because of this paper. Uh, I removed the filter socks because I'm lazy and, and I just, I hated cleaning my filter socks every, uh, every week. Uh, so uh, I noticed, again, this is anecdotal, I noticed that after removing my filter socks, uh, that I saw more polyp extension uh, on my acropora. And again, th th this, is, uh, this is just observation, uh, and, but I wonder whether, whether th this somehow, by removing, uh, so, uh, by, by filtering the water too much, we're, we're reducing the diversity of organisms in, in the water that corals could consume. Uh, and uh, again, you know, one of the biggest surprises for this is it seems like uh, it seems like there 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 is better ways uh, to feed the corals than some of the commercial preparations that uh, that we've uh, we've been using. So uh, the fact that refroids does worse than raw seawater uh, is pretty shocking. And, and in the first experiment, there was uh, seven out of the nine foods had no effect on on growth. So uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of a shock. It, it, it seems like we we have been kind of buying into the hype, uh, and I would love to see uh, more of these uh, studies uh, uh, being done on uh, on other corals and and other foods. Uh, just uh, uh, before I sign off, uh, I know that uh, I know that many of you have had experiences uh, where where your corals looked bad and you added a food. Uh, and you saw an improvement. So actually, I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking. I, I had a conversation about this with uh, my good friend uh, right before, like I published this video, and uh, and he, he had like uh, pale corals, and and he added a product, and right away the corals uh, appeared to recover. And I, I think I think you know many of us probably has these uh, these anecdotal observations. Uh, but the point is that if essentially if you're if you're really stripping your tank of nutrients, right? If you're starving on coral, then anything you put in a tank that has nutrients is gonna appear to have a good effect, right? So if you're starving, having the worst and nastiest meal in the world is gonna make you better. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, it's a healthy meal or it's gonna make you grow. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I, I, th I feel like I feel like many of us, when we started this hobby, myself included, we, I had this, uh, I had this uh, kind of obsession with uh, running tanks that have low or no nutrients, and the corals looked like crap. And and then we had to buy the additives that uh, that introduce uh, uh, nutrients back into the system. Uh, but I feel like I, I feel like this is just kind of a big play, a uh, big ploy by uh, uh, by some of the companies to essentially have us buy more products. So they sell us a bottle to remove everything from the water, and they sell us another bottle to add the nutrients back in. Where if in where if you could just maintain like a healthy aquarium, a balanced aquarium that's got nutrients and it's got bio load, then you're uh, you don't have to, then you're supporting a a larger population of organisms that are providing energy and food for your corals. Okay, guys, that's it on uh, on the topic of coral feedings. Obviously, the, this is just two papers, so you know it's it's not. It's not a lot, a big body of literature, but I feel like that both uh, both papers uh, presented some profound uh, profound findings about uh, how useful coral additives are to uh, 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 to uh, the health and growth of uh, our uh, our corals. And in both cases, it, it seems like a lot of these products are just kind of a waste of money. Uh, I will update this. Uh, I'm I'm always like uh, searching the literature for. Uh, uh, for new studies on, on coral food. So any any new paper that pops up, I'll, I'll be sure to review it. But uh, for now, I think I'm, I'm going to stop feeding my corals uh, and just keep feeding my fish. Thank you so much. Uh, if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, and see you around.